What's up everybody, it's Izzy, and in today's video we're going to talk about genetics. This is going to be part two. So in part one, what I covered was participation rates, how they increase when rewards increase. And I think the best example that I use that can illustrate this really quickly for anybody who didn't watch part one and doesn't want to watch part one for whatever reason is in the NBA. The NBA is the National Basketball Association and it is the professional the highest level of professional basketball. Um, in the 1950s, there was not a single player over seven feet tall. And it's not a coincidence that in the 1950s, you could not make a living playing basketball. You actually had to have a regular full-time job as well because the league didn't pay enough for you to make a living just playing the sport. However, in today's day and age, in 2010 and beyond, we're almost you know to 2020 here, uh, the best basketball players in the world make over $100 million on their of contracts. For example, Russell Westbrook was just signed to over a $200 million contract over the course of five years. So with the rewards increase that we now see in professional basketball, where the best professional basketball players are basically given a winning lottery ticket for the most part, um, the participation rate has increased so dramatically that now 25% of all men over seven feet tall in the United States have played professional basketball at some point in their life. So it went from there being zero men to now 25% of all men over seven feet tall having played professional basketball. And this is significant because there's probably not a crazy difference in the rate at which seven footers were produced in the 1950s and in the 2010s. However, what is very different is the recruiting system. We find these people a lot more easily and try to get them to play basketball. And they're more than willing to do it because, again, if you can become a professional basketball player, you're, it's basically a free ticket to becoming a millionaire. Now, why is any of this relevant to powerlifting? Well, this is all very relevant to powerlifting because with the surge in popularity over the past few years, it has now become possible to make a decent living doing powerlifting related business ventures. So obviously there's very few opportunities to win real prize money at meets as of yet. The US Open did offer a $40,000 first place prize this year, but besides that, there are very few opportunities to win real sizable cash prizes. However, you can build a t-shirt company, you can sell ebooks, you can sell online coaching, you can um, become popular on YouTube and make advertising money or get sponsorship deals. So if you have any sort of entrepreneurial spirit and uh, business savvy, entrepreneurial spirit and business savvy, you can make a above middle class living doing nothing but powerlifting related business ventures. And this is incredibly significant because if you offer people a good enough reward, and in this case, that is living an above middle class life where you don't have to work a nine to five, you can do what you're passionate about, travel a lot, see all different parts of the world and have just generally have a pretty cool life. There's going to be a lot of people competing for those rewards. It's the same thing as the NBA guys where there was no seven footers and now Pretty much every man over seven feet tall has tried his luck at professional basketball at some point in his life. Well, the same exact thing is going to happen with freaks of nature in terms of people who are gifted at building muscle or gifted with their just strength. And these people are not going to be produced at a higher rate per se. They're not going to be born more frequently, but the sport of powerlifting is going to do a better job of finding these people and enticing them to compete because they actual have, they actually there's legitimate rewards that can be waved in front of these people's faces to incentivize them. And um, so what happens when you get this scenario is that there are, and like I said in the previous video, outliers in sports tend to be extreme outliers. And the reason why this is significant is because a lot of times people think that the people at the top are necessarily super advanced, but this is not the case at all. A lot of times the people who are, who are at the top are at the, tarp, at the top because of overwhelming genetic advantages. And I'm going to continue to use other pro sports as an example because for whatever reason in powerlifting, people don't want to accept how important genetics are, so they'll just immediately reach for drugs when in fact genetics are more important than drugs if you know everybody's competing under the same conditions meaning drug tested or untested ultimately genetics are more important than drugs as long as there is a relatively level playing field so an example that i can use in this is in basketball um the nba for a long time allowed players to be drafted at the age of 18 into the nba and the nba is the highest level of professional basketball 
Uh, the current rule says that players have to be 19, but that's neither here nor there. So what I can tell you is that guy, let's, let's talk about a guy that pretty much all of you are going to know, and that's Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant was drafted into the NBA at the age of 18, meaning that in the eyes of the NBA as a whole, he is one, there are um, 15 players and 30 teams. So, you know, you can do the math. That is about 450 players. So when Kobe Bryant was first drafted, there was a few less teams in that. So maybe a few less, but ultimately let's just say for argument's sake that he was already one of the top 500 basketball players in the world at the age of 18. However, if you took Kobe Bryant at age 18 versus Kobe Bryant at age 30, the age 30 Kobe Bryant would have whipped his ass. But hold on, let's break this down even further. At age 21, Kobe Bryant was already an all-star. That means he was one of the roughly one of the 30 best players in the league. He didn't become an MVP candidate until his mid to late 20s. And an MVP candidate, for all intents and purposes, is usually one of the five best players in the league. So let's get this straight. He went from a player in his first year who was a bench player who barely played to at his peak, he was one of the best players of all time. Most people would say he's a top to 10 to 20 player of all time. However, by the time he was a professional basketball player at 18, and not even close to his personal peak performance, he was already one of the best players in the world. By the time he was 21, 22, he was already making all-star teams, and he had yet to become even close to his true prime, his true peak performance. And the reason why I mention this is the exact same thing happens in powerlifting all the time, and it blows people's minds just how people can't actually get their minds wrapped around it sometimes just how far ahead these people are and again i'm using basketball as an example because for whatever reason it's easier for people to accept genetics in other sports versus powerlifting so when you have guys who are starting so far ahead of everybody else of course they're also going to finish way further than everybody else as well because elite does not mean advanced kobe bryant was undoubtedly an elite player by the time he was 18 But he wasn't advanced in terms of barely being able to improve until he was in his 30s. Why is this important? Well, even just at USAPL Nationals, there's juniors winning the open division. And this happens every single year. I can think of three juniors this year who won. Um, Matthew Aromony, I don't know how you say his last name. I just know he's Snur on Instagram. Um, Russell Orr, he won. And Ashton Ruska won as well. So... There's people who are already the best in the world as juniors, but as juniors, we can safely say that they're not even at their physical primes yet because their physical primes won't happen until their late 20s, early 30s. So what's going to happen here is that these people are going to keep making progress at levels that resemble an intermediate trainee because ultimately that's kind of what they are. They're not at their peak yet. And again, you can think of so many examples of this. Ray Williams squatted 800 pounds at his first powerlifting meet in loose knee wraps at his first meet. By his third meet, he had squatted 900 pounds. And by something like, I think his 8th to 10th meet, he was squatting over 1,000 pounds. So again, that's a that it's almost, it's inconceivable that somebody could um, progress from 800 to 1,000 that quickly unless you realize that he wasn't near his potential yet. He was just getting into the sport. He had, at his very first meet, he did 800. Another example, Andy Bolton pulled 600 pounds. That's 270 kilos the very first time he tried deadlifts. He eventually got over 450 kilos, over 1,000 pounds. Now, anybody who adds 400 pounds to their deadlift over a lifting career is doing fairly well for themselves, Uh, especially if you started after, you know, you finished puberty. But when you're starting at 600 pounds, that's how you end up with the world record. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is, again, I really have to emphasize the point that just because somebody is elite does not mean that they are advanced. And so that is why sometimes we see the best lifters in the world, very young, very young, making progress at rates that you that are hard to believe because they're making progress at rates that only young lifters would make but again elite does not mean advanced elite means elite so it is actually possible for someone to be so gifted that they are still a novice or intermediate relative to their personal potential and yet competing 
at or near the highest levels. Again, Kobe Bryant at 18 made it to the NBA. At 21, he was an all-star. By his late 20s, he was an MVP candidate. Perennial consideration for best player in the league. Now, let's get into the part of this that I really want to talk about the most, and that is how to not be discouraged by all this. Um, well, in some in some in, in some ways, there is no way to not be discouraged by this if your goal getting into the sport was to become the world champion. Ultimately, one of the questions that people want to know is, do I have good genetics? Well, answering whether or not you have good or bad genetics is probably impossible, but it is very easy to tell if you have elite genetics or terrible genetics because people with elite genetics are generally competitive before they're even advanced lifters. However, for the vast majority of us, and yes, I'm definitely including myself in this group, we are not going to be doing this necessarily to one day become the very best power lifter in the world. That's probably not in the cards if you're not already elite within your first few years of training. However, to me, that is freeing rather than discouraging because ultimately I know that I'm doing this for myself. I'm not deluding myself saying I'm going to one day be the very best in the world. I'm doing this saying I want to see what I'm personally capable of. I want to reach my maximum potential and that's my personal goal. So it allows me to be happy, satisfied, proud, and encouraged whenever I set my own PRs because I'm not immediately like say for a long time I was in the 83 kilo class. So it's like Every time I set a PR, am I going to compare myself to John Hack, Brett Gibbs, and Russell Orhe and feel bad about myself, or am I just going to be happy that I set a PR? When you get rid of these, um, rid of the, these expectations, that these kind of unrealistic expectations to a degree, and I hate to use that term, of, of that you're going to one day be the very best in the world and instead just focus on yourself and stop comparing yourself to other people. The process can become so much more enjoyable and you can really take pride in what you've accomplished knowing that the reason that you're doing this is for yourself. Just like <laughs> many people who play pickup basketball are just out there having fun, competing, and adding something to their life that they enjoy, even though even though they know they're never going to beat, you know, somebody in the NBA or be, be the next Kobe Bryant, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be why you do this. So realizing that you can let go of some of these unrealistic expectations or just unrealistic standards or unrealistic comparison games that you play, and you can stop doing that, just focus on yourself and immediately... By immersing yourself in the progress, you'll probably make better progress and you'll also enjoy what you're doing a lot more. And anyways, that's all I had to say on the subject. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. As always, my friends, good luck through training and have a nice day. Peace.